most populated counties with a budget of $1.7 billion. The current chair, Tootie Smith, is running for re-election. Her main challenger, former Clackamas County Sheriff Craig Roberts. Tonight, we'll hear from the former sheriff tomorrow night from Tootie Smith. Craig Roberts was born and raised in Clackamas County. He serves as the county sheriff from 2005 through the end of 2020. That included a wild time or two, including devastating wildfires and much more. More recently, he's been retired, but not exactly unplugged. Still, I asked why he wanted to get back into the pressure-packed world of county politics. Well, first of all, I'm probably just like a lot of people out there that have been watching what's going on uh, in our communities and from the homelessness to the drug and mental health issues to affordable housing and, and really to the overdoses that are happening is that um, uh, I honestly just felt like I could do something and step up and make some changes that could really make a difference. And it wasn't just that, it, that I, I know the county's finances and I saw the direction the county was headed in and I really felt it was the wrong direction and concerned about services and programs that might be cut. They're just so important to our community that I just felt compelled that I really do need to step up. I mean, I, I love our county and uh, have seen it through a number of things throughout my career and just feel like I kind of bring a skill set that could help get us on the right path. What he's talking about are what he believes are looming cuts to many county budgets because of the building of the new Clackamas County Courthouse. The existing courthouse was built back in 1936 and there's wide agreement that it does need to be replaced. This is a rendering of what the new courthouse will look like. In 2021, the cost estimate was $189 million. By 2022, the cost had risen 60% to $313 million. The state of Oregon is paying roughly half the cost. But Clackamas taxpayers will be on the hook for the other half for the next 30 years. I asked Roberts what changes he would make. The biggest issue faced in the county, which I consider a financial tsunami, is a new courthouse that's underway. And I was in the planning process there uh, when I was sheriff. I continue to ask the question, how are we going to pay for it? I know we need a courthouse, but the fact of the matter is, is I didn't see the county revenue is enough to cover this enormous cost. It's right now, it's about 366 million. 2025, they have a $125 million debt service. Let me remind you, the general fund budget is 155 million. It just doesn't add up. And they don't want to go to the taxpayers for more money, right? Correct. And the polling for the, that was done with the taxpayers said 12% of the population support a new courthouse. So the citizens did not want it. And so they were supposedly going to get some money from the state, which that is coming through. But a lot of other counties in the state of Oregon have said, we just can't afford it. We can get the money from the state too, but we can't afford it. Hood River was one. So I felt like we're not in a position to uh, fund the courthouses as they saw it. And to this day, I really don't understand where all the money is gonna come from and the services that really will be impacted both right now and to come. So if you win the election though, you'd be saddled with the courthouse. How would you handle that? Uh, well, one of the first things I would do is uh, bring in an audit firm to come in and do a complete forensic audit of the county. And one of the things that a part of that has to be a citizen uh, uh, involvement. So I would have financial uh, smart citizens that know county finance, bring them involved and the unions involved because what we find, I know we will have to make cuts and what those cuts are. I do believe there are some ways we might be able to uh, identify some funding. I might be reaching out to the governor or other people to say, just look, here, here's where we're at. This is devastating our county. So uh, the first step is really assessing where we really are, talking about the programs that we can save and, um, uh, and then move on from there. So when you talk about cuts, would it be cuts to the planned construction or cuts to other budgets and leave, the, leave that train rolling down the tracks? Well, right now that, that, uh, that ship has sailed. That, that okay. courthouse is under construction and I'm sure by the time, if I'm fortunate to get in an office, I'll be the one that's responsible for picking up the mess. Okay. 
So, but it's not uh, like you can say, let's leave off the top floor or something. Exactly. Like Which was one of the recommendations I said to scale it back, phase the project, do anything, but don't go the full uh, construction because it will have a devastating impact. But regardless, they went in that direction. And, and that's why I'm, I'm concerned about all these services. I can tell you 16 years as a sheriff, every single budget was a fight for money to literally maintain what we have. So when I know they're adding this huge project thinking, well, where's that money coming from? Because it has not been a cakewalk for the last 16 years as sheriff just to have a balanced budget. So that is my top concern is really the financial future of Clackamas County. All right, so that's a lot. When Robert says the budgets were always a battle in Clackamas County, he's talking about past history, but I gotta tell you, that battle continues. Just about a year ago now, the new sheriff in Clackamas County, Angela Brandenburg, sent out a letter to the public warning that the county was taking control of her budget and cutting $5 million from it because the county needed $15 million to pay for the new courthouse. County commissioners reacted with outrage and said the change was simply an updating of internal costs that each department pays for county services. The budget year, by the way, is almost over now, and the sheriff is still saying that she'll need to cut $5 million because of that county budget. But back to our interview. While he was the county sheriff, Robert says he focused on mental health issues and drug and alcohol problems affecting the people of his county. Now, there's a whole host of other things that really uh, separate me from Tootie Smith. I mean, one of the things that, that I really bring to the table and that, you know, I've, I'm an honor to be a part of, but, you know, I created the, the largest drug and alcohol treatment uh, program in the state of Oregon, 80 beds. And we, it took us years to figure out how to make that program successful. We looked at uh, national best practices. We have an 88% success rate. And our goal is I cannot fix somebody's drug and alcohol issues in 30 days. It takes 12 to 18 months. We put you into clean and sober living and there's accountabilities along the way. And so two years after they've been released from our program, there's no rearrest. they're doing well in the community, and it takes longer, and it has to be a commitment. And so right now, what's happening is, there is a lot of money for drug and alcohol treatment and a lot of services, but what, what is happening so often is, they're throwing money at, let's get this building. It's the program that runs the building that makes the difference. It's not the building. Robert says as county chair, he would continue to focus on programs that get people off the streets and also work to support affordable housing. And he says he would work to bring all sides together to work through the upcoming budget challenges that he believes the county still faces. So what do you think about the former sheriff, Craig Roberts? What he had to say, what do you think? Did he sway your vote at all? Share your thoughts, will you? Email us. The address is this story at kgw.com or Call and leave a voicemail, 503-226-5090. I know not all of you are in Clackamas County, but yeah, we'd like to hear from you. Also a reminder, tomorrow night we'll feature my one-on-one -on -one interview with the current Clackamas County Chair running for re-election, Tootie Smith. We dive into the budget and so much more. That's tomorrow at 6.30. Coming up next now on The Story, an update on Portland's 90-day fentanyl emergency, which ends in about two weeks. So how things going? I think many of us are just frustrated with our system or lack thereof. Oh boy. Blair Best has new data on a pilot program that pairs police with outreach workers focused on addiction. All of that and more when the story returns.
Now let's turn to Portland's addiction crisis and an update on the fentanyl state of emergency declared in late January. On some days, outreach workers are pairing with police to try to help those struggling with addiction. And in some cases, they're able to send people directly to detox. But that depends on capacity. Blair Best hit the streets today and shows us how the deadly crisis continues in broad daylight. One didn't have to look hard Tuesday morning to see the pain on Portland streets. Emptiness feels like I'm not a person. On a tent covered corner in Old Town, a homeless man threatened city camp removal crews. So they called police. When officers got there, a man overdosed on fentanyl. Before the authorities and all that kind of came on, they all, there was all just hands in their pockets like, oh, there goes another one. He was Bobby's friend. He lost his family a couple years ago, and it was the anniversary of that, so I think, I think he just wanted to go see his family. Across the river, inside the Multnomah County boardroom. When presenting, make sure to unmute your mic. Attentions rose as commissioners were updated on Portland's 90-day fentanyl state of emergency, declared late January. Many of us are just frustrated with our system or lack thereof. The update included new details on a pilot project that pairs police with outreach workers in an effort to connect homeless people struggling with addiction to services. My addiction so bad, I'm a polysubstance user. I've been an addict since I was 11 years old. And I know Multnomah County truly appreciates the opportunity to support this pilot and continue making this difference in our streets. Data shows since mid-December to late February, police and outreach workers interacted with 99 people on the streets. 52 expressed an interest in services. 37 were connected to those services. And 14 got into same-day detox. The data goes on to show of those who wanted services, 47 percent, nearly half, did not get them. We are woefully under-resourced, so we need to really be investing in expanding capacity right now for treatment resources and health care in general. Joe Bezeggi is with Recovery Works Northwest, part of the team of outreach workers under this pilot. If we're going to be connecting with people and saying, okay, here is the door, here is where you're going to connect with resources, but the access and the capacity isn't there, then that potentially can do more harm than good. But getting into treatment and having nowhere to go, if you want somewhere to go after, I think is damaging. But for people like Bobby, who runs at the site of police, it's the program itself that can be damaging. Stop pairing with police. Like we have some people out here, like I said, with mental health issues, and they see police banner next to someone who wants to help, and it just makes them angry because they want the help, but they can't even articulate the ability to ask for it because they got to worry about going to jail. As for me, after this, once I leave... Okay, Blair, so it seems like that man there would want help, but he's saying the police involvement is getting in the way? Yeah, that's right, and many people are just like him. I mean, he tells us he has warrants out for his arrest, but that he would love housing and treatment. In fact, he said he has a housing voucher that he got last week, or last month, rather, but that he can't bring himself to ask for help because he's too afraid of being arrested. When he walked away today, the last thing he said to us was, look me up in a week, I bet I'm in jail. Hmm. All right. Well, how often are police and outreach workers doing this? I know that last week the program was expanded for another year. Right. So they're doing it sporadically a couple times a month. The next time they plan on going out is this Thursday, and their focus is downtown Portland, specifically Old Town. But today, county commissioners pretty much across the board called for this program to be expanded countywide, seeing as the fentanyl crisis is happening beyond just downtown. And here's what one commissioner had to say about it. I do have concerns. Uh, again, I mean, we've had conversations about how this is uh, really focused on the central core area, and um, East County cities are feeling pretty neglected. So I hope that uh, maybe we can talk offline and um, share best practices. I, I know that I've talked to the joint office, uh, and to make sure that I feel like we have so many silos within the county and with our partners. So I just want to make sure that um, maybe we can expand this program. All right, Blair, weren't we supposed to be getting more updates on this state of emergency? They said they wanted to keep this transparent. Yeah, that's right. And in the vein of transparency here, I do want to add this pilot project. It did not start 
during the state of emergency. It actually started before the state of emergency. So it wasn't something that came out of this declaration, even though, as you mentioned, it was expanded last week to last for a year. But yes, those updates, we were supposed to be getting them more regularly. I believe they said every 30 days. So far, we've only gotten one formal update. All the other updates have happened during county board meetings, which no one would know about unless you check the meeting agenda. So seeing as the state of emergency is ending in just a couple weeks here, by the end of April, I asked if we're going to get another update formally. They said yes, but that they don't know when. Oh, boy. All right. Well, thanks for staying on, Blair. I appreciate it. Great reporting as always. Now, let's get to some of your thoughts on our big story last night, looking at ways the local government handling the homeless crisis. We had two stories, one from Multnomah County, a report on a data system that the Joint Office of Homeless Services is just now getting control of eight years after the office was formed. And then Washington County, where the system that they built from the ground up is showing some early success. And then as a bonus, we went to Houston, Texas, where advocates say a housing first model operating for the last 12 years or so is getting thousands of people off the streets. Well, the issue that got most of you fired up has to do with the budget for Multnomah County's Joint Office of Homeless Services. If a budget similar to last year's is approved for this coming fiscal year, that will put the total of taxpayer dollars funneled into that office at over $1 billion in about nine years. A viewer, G.Y., wrote to us, I wish you would stop making my blood pressure go off the charts. How the heck can you spend a billion dollars and have nothing to show for it? One would think a billion dollars would be enough to figure things out and get a solution moving. Gosh, what a waste of dollars when police, fire, and schools all show mega deficits. A billion dollars over 10 years? What have they been doing with the money? Paying people's salaries so that people with homes can pay their mortgages while they go wander the streets looking for somebody to help? Build them homes. SROs, a room with a lock and a bathroom down the hall. Don't give them outreach and services and blah, blah, blah. They're homeless. They need a home. You can't build 10,000, 60,000 homeless people a home with a billion dollars? All right, thanks for that call. Strong emotions there. And then when it comes to the housing first or services first question, we heard from both sides. A self-identified landlord and story viewer named Steve, referencing the housing first model in Houston, Texas, wrote in to say, the Houston idea is really stupid. You show me one homeless camp on the streets that is clean and isn't full of garbage, junk, and trash and drugs. Once again, they're trying to dump it all on the landlords and make them fix their problems. But not everyone agrees. Of course, housing first. I mean, it's absolutely essential. You can't get mental health or a drug addiction problem or anything like that dealt with if you're still going back out onto the street. It just is insane. Look, when I was homeless over 20 years ago, I didn't have a drug addiction problem. I didn't have a mental health problem. But I saw a lot of people who did, and I knew that they weren't going to make it without getting into housing first. All right, thanks for all your comments. It's a big tent. We welcome all sides. Still to come on the story, a Tillamook woman recently reeled in a monster along the Oregon coast, and it could be a world record. Its name, Monkey Face Prickleback. The unconventional battle after she got it out of the water and how it tasted when the story returns.
Wildlife in the Pacific Ocean off the Oregon coast is a big deal. From whales to salmon to sea lions, many are creatures we've heard of before, but I'll bet you've never heard of the monkey face prickleback, which, <laughs> yes, is real. And a Tillamook woman caught a big one earlier this month, potentially world record big. Rebecca Jones went rock fishing back on April 1st. It was one of her first few times ever going out after she says her boyfriend showed her the ropes. She says she wanted to catch dinner. Boy, did she ever. I, you know, I cast it in and, and I felt one on and it didn't really feel very strong. And, but I, but I thought, you know, I'm just going to check and then reel it in. And then it felt a little bit, a little bit stronger and then nothing. And I thought, man, I lost it because you lose a lot of them. It's just, you know, that just happens out there and that's okay. So, so I was like, well, I'll just get it up and I'll rebate. They're still on the bite. And then I, I pulled up this huge, ugly, <laughs> what I thought was an eel. And I, I remember just like, it just kept coming out of the water. It was so long. And, and I, and I was looking at it just so confused and it was it was really docile it, so just sitting there you know long enough for me to even pull out my phone take a picture text that to a friend and i said what is this what what have i found here what did i catch and they told me what it was and of course april fool's day i thought it was a joke monkey face prickleback like are you kidding me did you just make that up <laughs> And so then I was able to Google it really quick. Yes, indeed, um, it was this. And then I saw that I had something pretty big and, and I was so excited. And she has a pretty well-informed friend too, I'd like to say. At 28 inches long and 4.8 pounds, Jones realized it was really a special catch, but her excitement did not last long. Turns out these fish can live outside of the water for up to 37 hours. So once it was landed, then the real battle began. Then, then this fish started to fight and I, it's, it was about half of my length. And so I had to jump on this beast <laughs> and hold it down. I almost lost it in the rocks, but I am telling you again, I am so determined. Um, even through the scraping of the barnacles and almost losing it, I was able to pull it up sit on it again and get that hook out and then um, get it into this mesh bag that I use to hold the fish so I don't lose them in the rock. So that is the story of catching the ugliest thing that I have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> monkey face prickleback are often called monkey face eels for obvious reasons. They live along California and mostly southern Oregon's rocky shores. They can live for up to 18 years. The current world record monkey face prickleback is three pounds, four ounces, caught in Yaquita Bay in 2008. So Rebecca's 4.8 pounds would, for lack of a better term, blow that one out of the water. She's waiting for official certification from the International Game Fish Association. But despite the creature's appearance, Jones says, tasted really good. Yeah, lobster. Yeah, it has the texture and uh, you know, like a very delicate flavor because it is it is a rockfish. And so I, w I could compare it to cabazon or link cod, but the texture truly is is like lobster. So that was surprising to me. I did not expect that. That was my goal was was to feed my family. And so that's what I got out of it. I mean, it is so <laughs> for as good as it tastes. It's not like the spectrum of like ugly and then <laughs> delicious. It's so it's so wide. So, you know, don't judge a fish by its face, I guess. <laughs> I would say. I love that. It's a great line. Don't judge a fish by its face. Right on. Words to live by. Hey, that's the end of our show. Thanks so much for watching. And remember the story, our collective story that never ends. The good stuff's coming your way next. I'll see you right back here tomorrow night at 630. In the meantime, we're saying goodnight with a live look out the window. I think this is Newport. Looks gorgeous.